five minutes past. Is that okay? Yeah. Twenty past. Okay, lovely. Thanks very much. Um, so this is an extract from a paper that Alessandra Molinari have, uh, have, have written, and it's about to be published any minute. It's uh, being published in a book called Designing Norman Sicily, edited by Emily Winkley, Emily Winkler, and others, and it's going to be uh, published by Boydell. So it's going to appear quite quite soon. And that article compares Norman transition in Sicily with the Norman transition in England. And amongst the, the, the things that a bit were discussed is whether there is a concept of normanitas and whether we may look for similar uh, Norman uh, events in different places where the Normans were. <laughs> the answer is that it's, it's, it's very difficult because although Leslie Abrahams has produced the, the idea of a diaspora or of um, Scandinavian people uh, materially, uh, materially witnessed by th things like the lead brooches collected by Reach, the, the um, fact is that only England really has a portable antiquary scheme, so it, we're about the only place you can actually plot this. At the moment, it's very hard to get a feeling, apart from the architecture and so forth, which I'm not dealing with, in general, of whether there is a, a, a Norman or Nan normality at all. So, project our project is called Sicily Transition, the Archaeological Regime Change. It's going on at the moment. These are all the people sponsoring it, some of the people involved. And what I'm going to do very quickly is to just draw out some of the footnotes, really, of uh, our study and uh, see if it's helpful to your discussion. I apologize if I'm going to be saying things that you've already been discussing earlier. Um, today's been a terrible day, uh, something like four of the things I have to go to were all at the same time, um, with, uh, and I was unable to choose. Um, so very briefly, this is the area that the Normans eventually, or they became the kings of. Uh, the, the, the time area we're looking at here is basically from the um, Arab governance of Sicily to the Norman governance of Sicily to the Swabian governance of Sicily. Uh, so we're interested mainly in the Calvids, 948 to 1040. Uh, so they are the Fatimid group who, who took over and made Palermo the capital and made Sicily very prosperous. And then there was a Norman invasion. Roger II built a kingdom. And uh, that, was a place, that was a time of considerable prosperity as well. Uh, then there was unrest, then there were the Swabians, and at the moment, although the dating is not particularly uh, precise, uh, it does look as though the, the big change became with the Swabian uh, regime rather than the Norman. So we have various levels at which Norman influence can be observed, obviously in architecture and art, that is a very important one, that nowhere more important than Palermo, top left, and corner is the uh, Norman Palace. In the Norman Palace is the Capella Patina, that is, Palatina. Um, this is a Norman built chapel, uh, which nevertheless uh, embraces Byzantine and Arab themes. Now, for some time, this has been considered to be evidence of a multicultural Sicily, in the sense that people living in Palermo and walking about the streets are somehow. A, multicultural, and B, tolerant. Well, that may not be, not be true, but this really isn't, as Jeremy Johns has shown, this isn't really the evidence for that. What this is the evidence for is a very astute politician, Roger II, uh, making a, a symbolic statement about the kingdom that he wishes to, to produce, wishes to run. And that kingdom is going to take the best of the Arab uh, civilization of, of Sicily, and then add it to Norman zest and make of it something really special. Now, archaeologically, it, the Arabs in, in Palermo are actually quite hard to see. I mean, they're documented there, and the period was very wealthy, but only a few things, like the Arab script to the cathedral and this famous uh, multilingual memorial in four languages, only, only those things uh, have, uh, have kind of survived above ground. This is Alex Metcalf's map of of Palermo in the Arab period. Uh, this is the central fortified area, um, uh, Phoenician as well as Byzantine. 
the Al Khazar in the Arab period. And then when the Khalids came, they built this uh, sort of elite fortress, the Khalisha, um, on one side. Marked on this map, too, by me, are the four principal Islamic cemeteries, or rather the four principal cemeteries, many of which have Islamic burials in them. Uh, here they are on the, on the actual um, um, geographical map, and in the white spots mark the centre of the old town, either side of which there were rivers. Now these in yellow, here, uh, well, in, yes, in yellow, I think it's yellow, it might be gold, uh, this is, these are the cemeteries, these are the sightings, of the, this is urban archaeology. You get, you get a small hole and you get a sighting of a skeleton, and then a bit further on, you get another sighting, another skeleton. And we are making some assumptions about whether this is one cemetery or so. But notice that they move from north of the Chala, of the, um, the harbour, um, and then they move to the south of it, and they eventually end up near the station. And that's in order of date so far. These cemeteries are, uh, the first of them there is the Byzantine cemetery, the next two have Islamic burials, uh, and then these are primarily Islamic burials near the, um, near the, uh, the, um, uh, the other side, south of the harbour. And I want you to notice how late they go, bearing in mind the timings we have, um, and bearing in mind also that the historical information that we get that uh, the Normans and then the Swabians uh, uh, somehow deport Muslims if they don't suppress them. So these burials have been recent, recently really carbon dated and uh, the, the, the latest uh, Islamic burial we have goes to the early 14th century, so that is after the Swabian. So this is a theme that is beginning to emerge that um, the burial rite and maybe the beliefs that go with the burial rite are not in sync with the changes of regime. It's something we were pleased to find, let me put it that way. And I think there is many other aspects of material culture that also is telling its own story. And they don't always converge, but sometimes they do. So Segesta is outside Palermo, on the west side of Sicily, uh, quite a, a well-known temple site in the Hellenistic period. Um, and that is uh, also a, a theatre belonging to that settlement. Um, it became even more famous when Alessandro Molinari started excavating at the Monte Abara, which is right at the top, uh, and found a complex of buildings, a church, and then Muslim burials around the side of the theatre, and then uh, a mosque. So clearly there had been some kind of transition here between an Islamic uh, community and a Norman community, losing those, using those terms rather loosely. But the pottery said they were very close in date, and therefore we were excited and felt that there would be some multiculturalism coming our way, uh, but there really wasn't. Um, this is the castle which sits on the Arab village. The mosque was destroyed before the church was built. And these Islamic burials all around the edge of the theatre. Incidentally, this is another theme of uh, Sicilian um, funerary archaeology. Uh, Islam buries round the back of the stalls of, of a theatre, for whatever reason that is. They do it again at Montiato. There are very many interesting uses of previous Roman and Greek sites in Sicily, as elsewhere in the Mediterranean. I haven't got time to go into them, but I just draw your attention to this as quite an interesting marker. This is the Christian cemetery um, mapped out. Norman church is there. 15th century church took its place. And these buildings here are part of the Arab village. And they are cut by the Christian burials. So prima facie, it is a sequence. There is an Islamic settlement on top of the hill. It has its own mosque. It has its own cemetery. Then there is a Norman castle on top of the hill. It has its own church. It has its own cemetery. So uh, they, they look different. The Christians lie on their backs in kists and the Muslims lie on their sides, not in kists. So first on radiocarbon dates from this project, which has got something like 200 
radiocarbon dates um, uh, which are in the, cap, in the process of, of, um, of being determined. These are, these are the suggested ones. Here we are. These are, sort of, these are Christian. The generality is, is fairly clear. And then uh, Derek Hamilton, East Kilbride, says there's a 71% pro uh, probability that there is a hiatus between these two communities. So, uh, Palermo, Suggesta, and my third case study is Castronovo, where we've been digging since 2014. This is a site which is attractive because it's got Byzantine, Arab, Aglomid period, um, Fatimid period, and Norman and Swabian all in the same place. Here's some excavations going on. In the background is the Byzantine fortress of Volticassa, and the foreground is the excavation at uh, Casale San Pietro Intervention 5, which has proved extraordinarily indicative of the transitions that are happening in uh, Castronovo. We not only get a very interesting sequence of buildings, which have been relatively well dated up to now, ending in the Norman period, or ending in the Norman stroke Swabian period. There's also a lot of material. The pottery follows its own story as well. Uh, basically, the very good, nice pottery with the pictures is Calvid, is Arab, is Islamic. And the, the Norman pottery is on the dull side. I think Paolo will correct me, but we, we haven't got as much as we think we should have of the Norman period. It gets better in the Swabian period. So the Norman period seems to be accompanied by a certain amount of monumental architecture. We have a Norman castle, we have a Norman church, but it's silent on the ground. This is something that people living in England might be also familiar with. That camel comes from that side, by the way. And that thing on the left is a sugar pot. I don't know whether anybody else was in the sugar session we had, but it was very exciting and interesting. Um, Veronica Anchechi has just finished her thesis. She's been talking about it this morning. Uh, the interesting things we learn from her, among, yeah, among many interesting things we learn from her, checking my own phone here, um, is that uh, the uh, Arab uh, culture has a very fond of sheep, doesn't have much pig uh, in the towns, and uh, the pig comes back with the Norman period. That's pretty obvious. However, in the countryside, we do eat pork, and they do seem to be it's quite likely that there are Christian uh, um, communities there, which are serving the, uh, yeah, which are serving the um, Arab hierarchy in in Palermo. Castanova has certainly got lots to trade. It's growing a lot of food, so we're all really interested in food. And these are some of the changes being observed. These are um, Veronica's sheep, which get bigger each. Regime. Uh, these are, this is the food that is coming in uh, from with, with the Arabs. It does seem to be real. We are finding real plants. Um, here's the Norman keep down there. Polisandetai Norman church. A bit of architecture for those who like it. Here's our town, and here's my conclusion. So the main points really are that we have a change here, not between people like the Anglo-Saxons and people like the invading Normans, but also the Hauteville family invades, and it invades a very civilized country in the middle of the Mediterranean, which is already in contact with lands to the east, the Far East even, so that's where some of this fruit, like the orange and the lemon, comes from, uh, as well as, of course, into Spain and the south of France. So a very, very much more powerful um, uh, uh, regime is the sitting tenant when the Normans arrive. Um, when the Normans do arrive, they recognize, or Roger II, maybe it's just a personal genius, he recognizes that they are enormously interesting and talented people uh, who are doing, uh, who, are, who are growing a lot of food and who, who are delivering a lot of prosperity. However, they still go to places like Suggesta and Bill Castles, unless the dating is going to show us that is Swabian. Right? I can't emphasize enough that between the year 1061, which is the, the, the earliest the Normans arrive, and 1250, when, the, when Frederick II dies, between those times, we don't have good dating. Now, everybody talks about Norman pottery, Swabian 
cooking pots. They, the, this adjective is thrown about right, left, and centre. But we don't have the precision yet from the archaeology uh, to add to this story materially. We don't, we're not able to say what the changes are, because we are, but we're not able to say when they are. And I think that does need emphasising. We know that Islamic burial continued under Norman and Swabian regime. So if the living are being deported, the dead are still being buried, and they're still being buried in the Muslim rites. Swabian appears to be the main, at present, the main disruption to settlement of religion under Frederick II. And I think that we can say that the town and the country, commerce, religion, burial practice, are all on separate trajectories, but they, also, they often converge. They're like streams of ideas which sway around and then converge at, at a certain time. And certainly we can expect Islamic, Jewish, Christian communities to be self-defining and to coexist in both the Arab and the Norman regimes. So, so that's the definition I've come up with so far on Normanitas in Sicily. Thank you.